It's lager time. Yay! Yay. Lager time. Poems, stories, and thoughts. By me, Paul Creek. Who else? Greetings, bonjour, what's happening? Welcome to Lager Time. Welcome back to Lager Time. It's a Friday. Back to Friday. Let's hope it remains that way. So it's all been a bit wonky these last few weeks, mainly due to just being pretty busy with work and life. I've also been concentrating on trying to get this EP finished. Finishing things is not exactly a strong point of mine, let alone finishing things with efficiency. Something I'm working on, which sounds like an empty platitude. It might be. I don't think it is. But time will tell. There's work to be done. I'm trying to do it which all sounds a bit cryptic, but I don't want to bore you with the details. So I did a little promo rap verse for this EP I've got coming out called Toast in the Machine. I made the beat, wrote the bars, recorded and filmed it and stuck it up online, not really thinking about it beyond the usual worries about it being rubbish. It's been viewed on Instagram over 600 times, which for what I do is loads. It's a tiny amount for any sort of creative with a big online presence, but whenever I put anything up, this, YouTube, Instagram, whatever, it's rare anything ever goes beyond three digits. So I was chuffed about that. I'll stick a link in the podcast description for anyone that wants to see. Big thanks to everyone that watched and shared. And speaking of numbers, Lager Time is now one years old. Large up all the Lager Lights. Didn't really know what I was doing when I started it. Just wanted a place to share some stuff as I was a bit lost with everything I was doing. But I was still writing stuff like I always have. One year on, feel like I've learned a lot, particularly with the producing side of things. Still a bit lost, but I've really been enjoying doing these satellite stories. A few years back, I thought I was done with writing this loosely autobiographical stories from my childhood. But clearly not, because there's loads more I want to do, plus a whole series of being in London in my 20s. And there's more I'd like to learn in terms of the production of it. However, the stories are getting more and more elaborate and I need more time to write them and put it all together. This current one has been on my laptop for almost a month and it still ain't finished. So it's half done, like many things I do, frustratingly. Normally at this point, with podcasters and the like that are more efficient with this kind of thing, they'll normally go, for the price of a pint or whatever, you can donate to my artist fund thing. Well, I've tried to set up a Ko-Fi account but I'm currently locked out of my own Stripe payment system account that I use on my website and I don't know what the email is that I use to set it up, which is typical of me. But if you did want to help me out in any way, what would be really good is if you could subscribe on Substack or just tell anyone that you know who might just like this little niche thing that I'm doing to start listening that would really be helpful or maybe one day if there was enough of us we could all go and get lagered up somewhere and have a laugh though not right now because i'm skin and off the booze for the foreseeable anyway that's enough for now let's get down to business and you make sure you have a banging weekend peas and taters paul Satellite Stories, episode, not volume, Paul, five. I think it's five. A date with mates. 
Year nine. Awkwardly stepping into those big boy shoes. With all the grace of a first time ice skater at the Guildford Spectrum. Trying not to fall over in front of his mates. Or worse, females that you might be attracted to. Which by this age, was probably all of them. Lingo's getting sharper. More gel on the head. Extra sprays of the links. Maybe saving up to buy a pair of designer boxes so you can have the brand name shine on the waistband. Couple lads in my year were already about it. Might have got some feel ups. Might have even lost the V plates. Maybe chinned a couple of bods. Boys like Shane O'Connell and Ronnie Wader rising up the ranks of named cruelly faces. In my jagged circle, apart from maybe Gareth, Brendan and Kells, most of us were nowhere near any of it. Not even Mo. We'd boshed a few special brews and smoked a couple of fags, maybe even a bit of draw. But that was about it. When it came to girls, me, Rich, VJ and Pidge were walking cliches. Redundant garden space hoppers bulging with spoof. With the exception of Rich, we couldn't even claim to be good at football. Football, fighting and females made up the holy trinity, the triple F key to life. Ideally, you wanted to be a good at least one of those three. None and you were just making up the numbers. Like one of those random WWF wrestlers with a normal name like John Whitfield with no costume who get drafted in just to get slapped about, all for the kiddies holding up cardboard signs in honour of their spandex roid head heroes. Even if you could, like me, occasionally pick a pass or get someone in the headlock, it weren't sufficient. Awkward, unconfident and immature, the triangular tragedy, the triple T key to a life of misery. Yet we were frizzing with testosterone like buying a load of cheap gear at a Maplin's closing down sale, none of which you know what to do with. Through some rogue cousin of VJ, whose uncle had a corner shop, our little firm had a nice supply of jazz mags on rotation, like a pubescent book club for teenage wankers. Business was booming. The C-block toilets was where the contraband was exchanged with kids from other years for cash, tapes, trainers, watches, sweeties, etc. We never quite knew exactly how VJ got his hands on the jazz mags and never stopped to consider exactly how many hands had been on the jazz mags, but we were happy to be in business, ecstatic even, about as close as any of us was going to get to getting off with any chicks, let alone anything else. Despite some of Rich's best efforts, we got little to no attention of the flirting sort from chicks in our year, though to be fair, there were a few we got on alright with. We wanted to talk to them, all the time, just in my case, didn't quite know how, so any time I did, I squeezed those funny feelings into a cartoon suitcase and just about squashed it down, thinking, hoping, they might just think that I might be cool, thoughtful, yet considerate. Tragic, yet funny, yet deep. A pussy. There was a crew of girls from Horsham who were cool enough but weren't the perceived popular girls in the year, probably a bit too middle class, but their near futures would no doubt see them taking that crown when the likes of the above dropped out after GCSEs. Most of them containing that healthy balance of being in the higher sets with brains and ambitions as well as good looks which put them firmly out of any of our leagues. I resented them a bit for appearing to be stuck up, though they were actually alright once you got chatting to them. Me, Rich, VJ and Pidge sat next to three of them in art class, Natalie, Helen and Lauren. They were alright. I fancied Lauren. Though I didn't tell anyone about it, I was playing it cool, hoping a suitable moment would arise through my coolness to let them... Any one of them, I didn't mind, let me know that Lauren fancied me, like playing hide and seek by hiding in plain sight. Ironically, no one ever found me. 
BJ and Pidge both fancied Helen and Rich fancied Natalie. Rich was the alpha of our group. He was good at football, without being an alpha, like a class with a teacher on the sick being taught long term by the TA. We lacked leadership. Rich had potential though. He would engage the girls in conversations during art lessons, sometimes making them laugh, and we'd join in off the back of his advances, also trying to make them laugh, hungry for scraps, each one of us boys probably getting pissed off of the other for not acting cool enough, or for taking perceived ground from the other. Rich had balls though, and belief, just lacked the finishing touch. Fair play to him, I don't know how he did it, but he managed to convince Helen, Catherine and Lauren to come bowling on Saturday with us boys. Four boys, all as clueless as each other, and three girls, smarter yet surprisingly game, or most likely just being nice, or worse, mischievous. The other three concocted a plan where they were each going to ask out the girl they fancied. By attempting to play it cool, without being in any way cool, I could see this probably wasn't going to end well. Yet by the pure power in the lure of even the remotest possibility that one of these chicks might get off of us, it was enough to propel even me along with the sheer excitement and nervousness of going bowling with some females. Even when I didn't fancy two of them, I still fancied them. They were female. I was stamping on that suitcase, squeezing everything in, even if that meant damaging things. So donned up, I jumped on the train to Crawley. Us boys had arranged to meet outside CNA at 1pm, then meet the chicks at half one. Possibly the only time any sort of strategy was ever considered and actually implemented into some sort of plan. I was an hour and a half early to meet the lads and two hours early to meet the girls. I had no idea why. Killing time, however, on my Jack Jones was nothing for me. I was well used to wandering around on my own, absorbed in my own thoughts and fantasies, like a docile Labrador wandering around an art gallery, not knowing it was in an art gallery. I just prayed no one saw me in town on my ones. No one wanted to be a loner, even though a lot of the time I was a loner. Lona! I'd walked into Primark, thinking I could get myself some faux designer boxes that said something like athletic on the waistband and could pass as designer when I turned around and saw Kells with his younger brother and a couple of other Larry lads in tracksuits that I didn't know. Oh no. What are you doing in town, bruv? I played it down, as I didn't want him gate crashing the gig. Said I was meeting Pidge, which was true. Pidge was low enough down the social hierarchy to not warrant any sort of jealousy on Kel's part. Yeah, that's good to know because I was going to see his mum. I left some pubes around here, know what I mean? <laughs> Hope you gay boys have a nice time. At that, fortunately Kel's bowled off somewhere in the direction of the mall with his little squad laughing at his tired mum jokes routine. Those pricks didn't know Pidge, so why were they laughing? I was happy he was gone though. Last time I'd spent a Saturday afternoon with Kells, we got kicked out of Gatwick Airport because he kept booting the 10p machines in the South Terminal Serendipity Arcade and setting the alarms off, alerting the board, but machine gun carrying old Bill to send us packing back to Hawley. I purchased a pair of blue faux designer tight fitting boxes and stuffed them in my pocket and casually bowled up the Bartlets, rolled round at the top, past the entrance to the mall and towards CNA. The rendezvous wasn't the best, as it was right next to McDonald's. Big Kasim and his boys were often seen outside there, and if you weren't careful, you'd be buying all him and his crew Big Macs. I spied Rich and VJ already waiting. I got closer and clocked that one of them stunk heavily of brute. Rich saw me and rubbed his hands. It's going to be a good day, boys. I can feel it. He had on cream jeans with an umbro polo top tucked in. VJ had on a Ralph shirt and his dark black hair was slicked back, but for some reason had a backpack with him. He noticed me looking at it. Bought a bit of cat, boys. Me and Rich looked at each other. Cat? Cat. Yeah, cat, as in pussy. Bought a couple more titles for the collection, boys. Rich looked at me. 
No one calls it cat. VJ wasn't listening. He was unzipping the bag and there was at least four jazz mags in it. There's a Christmas special with Cindy Cooper and Joe Guest. In our sordid top shelf back of the back of the drawer worlds, Cindy Cooper and Joe Guest were top drawer, top shelf, top drawer. Me and Rich were a bit miffed as to why he brought them along, but also not complaining. One each to take away, boys. Couldn't argue with that. A bonus for me and a safety net, as the actual chance of getting close to any of these chicks was so remote they might as well have been a brass house on Pluto. Maybe VJ was a realist. Get us in the mood, boys. VJ was wiggling his eyebrows as he said it, though I wasn't quite sure what he meant, or was expecting for that matter. Just then Pidge slowly waddled up. He was called Pidge for a reason, because he waddled like a pigeon and was plump like a pigeon and pigeons weren't very cool, etc, etc. He hated the name. Pidge loved music and always had his headphones on, something we bonded over, though he was more into heavy metal than I was. He had his headphones on and as he waddled over looking very pleased with himself for some reason, he was wearing stonewashed double denim with a far too big pair of Converse tarmacs looking like a pigeon with tractors on its feet with a white visor on top of his head to finish off the look or so we thought he tried hard Pidge he really did the fuck are you wearing Pidge? what? I look good VJ looked pleased he just went one nil up in the race for Helen's attention it was soon to be two as the calls came in from a distance Pidge you fat wanker look at the state here we all looked up to see over the road, running away from the moon with Kells and with his little crew in tow, all pointing and making wanker signs at Pidge. They appeared to be in hysterics, whilst making the odd look over their shoulders, back at the moon. My eyes quickly darted to the entrance doors to the moon, where I saw three security guards watching them run off into the distance, one bringing a walkie-talkie to his mouth. As they shouted, Pidge had to turn around to see them, turning his back to us revealing the piece de resistance to his outfit. The abuse all made sense. On the back of his stonewashed denim jacket, covering the entirety of his back, in blue biro, doing his best worst bubble writing, Pidge had written, fuck you. And in between the fuck and the you, at the top and the bottom respectively, was a giant fist flipping the middle finger. He tried Pidge. He really did. Problem was, Pidge had drawn five knuckles, making the middle finger the sixth, which kind of said it all. Pidge, what have you done? Oh no, cool, innit? Rich was smiling. Sick. VJ looked at me. No, Pidge. No, it really isn't. 2 nil, VJ. I stayed stunned. We then stood there waiting around for another 20 minutes or so and after a couple of true crawly custodians had cussed off Pidge for his jacket he decided to turn his back to the window of CNA which then caused a mum to come out from inside of her two young boys in tow to have a full blown go at all of us about Pidge's offensive jacket. It was at this point Rich took up the mantle and displayed a little bit of leadership doling out some wise words. Whatever you do Pidge, don't turn your back on those chicks today. Can't have you messing things up. But they're going to love it though. The girls were already 25 minutes late. None of us daring to air the fear of humiliation hanging in the air. When Pidge and VJ decided to go into McDonald's next door and get something to eat. Comfort food. I decided to save off from eating and save my money. Rich, being the acting alpha, had ordered Pidge to get him some fries. They came back out 15 or so minutes later, empty handed having not eaten. Not only had they run into Big Cass in there, who'd mugged them into buying him a Big Mac meal, Shane O'Connell had appeared, who was now apparently rolling with Big Cass, which was terrible news for every teenage boy in probably a 10 mile radius. Apparently when Pidge turned around to get in the queue to buy Cass's food, Shane had seen Pidge's jacket and taken the fuck you as a personal pop at him and then ordered VJ to also buy him a Big Mac meal as well as taking Rich's chips as compensation, or tax, as Shane would call it. We got taxed. 
They came out hungry, humiliated and with only enough money left for one game of bowling. We were supposed to be showing these chicks a good time. How are they going to respect us now? Even with Rich's £5 crisis loan. It was looking worse than before. It's longer time. Yay! Yay. Lager Time, Poems, Stories and Thoughts, by me, Paul Cree. Who else?